think um, we're going to start this event. Welcome, my name is Julia Moritz. I'm the head of the Maybe Education and Public Programs of the Documenta. And um, thank you for coming in this early hour after some exciting opening days. Um, I'm very happy this morning to open a new series of our program. We have a whole um, number of series actually dedicated to the question of writing and of reading, which, as you know or might have seen, um, also resonates with uh, the work that the publication department of the Documenta has achieved, the notebooks, the catalogs, this many amazing books that they do, artist books, over the last year. And it's now um, in the public programs that we try to continue this, um, this work, but also thinking about publishing, about writing, about fiction, but also about the format of the book uh, as, a, um, as a cultural product. So this morning we opened the series that is called Paper Mornings, the book presentations of the Documenta 13. And it's of course a little bit of a play, word play, because the morning paper in English is what you would naturally read now on your coffee table. And we're gonna reverse that a little bit and um, are very happy to talk with you over all upcoming 14 Sundays about books that are very important to us, that have um, important relation and connections to Document 13, or that are also even produced by us. So um, welcome this, to this first event of the Paper Mornings. And I'm particularly happy to introduce it with a very special um, organization that we share a lot of discussions, but also have generously supported artistic projects in the exhibition, the score um, now I have to always look up the full name, the SCORE Foundation for Art in the Public Domain. So um, I'm very happy to welcome the director, Fulia Ademci, to introduce this event to us. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Uh, uh, thank you for coming here after four days of uh, a intense but very inspiring uh, destruction of art. Uh, hopefully today with Teddy Cruz, uh, we will continue the reflection and uh, destruction, hopefully. Uh, uh, this is uh, the second uh, publication uh, of SCORE in the series of Actors, Agents and Attendants, which is a research project, a symposium and publication series initiated by SCORE in 2009 under the curation of Marcus Missan, Andrea Phillips, and myself. And uh, uh, of course, uh, the first one, uh, you can also find the book uh, uh, of the actors, agents, attendants, uh, was on healthcare and care. Uh, this project is mainly initiated by us in order to investigate the fields that SCORE is traditionally active, which is healthcare, education, urban transformation, and uh, social housing. But uh, uh, as you all know, these uh, fields, these sites, are also the major sites uh, which, was, uh, uh, inf uh, which was impacted uh, by the uh, meta global changes and transformations in the governance and ideology. Uh, maybe you all know uh, the Netherlands last year uh, announced the big cultural cuts uh, uh, and uh, uh, it uh, was, uh, it was uh, uh, obvious for us, for that reason we started in 2009, but uh, unfortunately this, uh, uh, we can call it financial dictatorship or financial coup d'etat, uh, uh, has also Influence score like Reichs Academy and many other uh, institutions. Uh, I think it's now time to think to uh, collaborate and uh, uh, do things collectively. And uh, I'm very excited today to uh, uh, have uh, Teddy here because he will uh, also uh, emphasize these aspects. Uh, I don't talk much. Uh, I know that all of you are excited to listen to the uh, lecture, but I sincerely want to thank to Documenta, uh, Julia, uh, Caroline, Chus, and uh, Övül very much, and uh, uh, our uh, team, uh, and specifically Michelle Franke, uh, who coordinates uh, all the uh, launch and uh, uh, the publication. 
Uh, thank you so much, and I want to give the floor to my co-editor, Andrea Phillips. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Hello, and just also to um, replicate the thanks. It's fantastic to be part of Documenta. I'm Andrea Phillips. I'm chair of research in the art department at Goldsmiths, but also have been working with Folia for the past three years, and initially with Marcus Meeson as well, on developing this concept of actors, agents, and attendants. What, why have we called it actors, agents, and attendants? I want to talk a little bit about that before we get on to Teddy Cruz, who is going to open this up much further. But the idea of actors, agents, and attendants really is to think about the way in which we reconfigure the relationships, not only generally, in terms of the social constructions of our failing uh, social democratic neoliberal states, but also within the art world. The ways in which we configure ourselves around who is an artist, who is a curator, and who is a public. There are many, many interesting projects at Documenta at the moment that are involved in this re rethinking, reassemblage, reconstitution of relationships between the figures that we normally think of as artists, the figures that we normally think of as curators, and the people that we think about in other roles. So for instance, planners, um, politicians, um, and people that come and attend the work that we make as, uh, as professionals within the art sphere. It seems to us, working through this concept of public art within, um, the, uh, within the field, particularly of the Netherlands, but also internationally, that actually the ways in which those configurations have operated in the past, specifically under, in Europe and North America, what we used to call the welfare state, but of course is no longer really operational or operating, that configuration in a way is now failing and we need to rethink it. So the question that we ask through publication, through symposium and through things like biennales is how can we use our institutions and our organizations, our temporary, and per uh, temporary events and permanent sites to rethink and reorganize ideas and practices. So this is what Actors and Agents and Attendants is trying to do. Specifically at the moment, we're focusing on social housing, as Fulia said, particularly because social housing was the fulcrum of the 2008 crisis. Although this is a disputed fact, but many people would say that um, the subprime mortgage uh, um, overspend, um, the um, a catastrophic lending policies under capitalism were the thing that promoted and preempted and made the financial crisis that we are now um, uh, living in the midst of, okay? And of course, the financial crisis that starts in North America and Europe, but has global and transnational ramifications unevenly across the world. So. Social, so social housing seemed to be a really interesting and important thing for us to think through, but also on the basis that we knew and were interested in further researching many artistic and architectural long-term practices that for many years had been investigating and intervening into the field of social housing. Okay, so we wanted to bring these two things together. In many ways, Actors, Agents and Attendance is a project that tries to bring different fields together to kind of cohabit um, in terms of ideas and practices and see what happens. And of course, when you do that, sometimes you get disagreements, sometimes you get agreements. What you always produce through that contradiction is fantastic new ideas and hopefully practices. So this is what we've been trying to do in many fields. The book, Social Housing, Housing the Social, which um, we, we're, we're only just beginning to thumb through ourselves now because it's only just arrived, designed by Meta Haven um, and with many, many contributors. Um, and I'm not going to go through them all now because we have to quickly move on to Teddy Cruz because it's more interesting than me talking. Um, uh, th th we have many different contributors in this book from um, artists who've been working for a long time in social housing, either as a kind of, um, a either through exhibition format. So for instance, we have Martha Rosler in the book who since the late 1960s, through extraordinarily important photographic and installation practices have has made, um, have made in incredible interventions. For instance, her early work on the Bowery through to House Beautiful and through to um, bringing the war back home has always and consistently made this relationship between art, 
global politics and the making of images and um, images about the home, about the house, particularly for her as a feminist through to artists like Jana van Hayswick, who at the moment is making a, a long-term research project in social housing in Liverpool, um, and, uh, and Maya, Maya Tita Potrug, for instance, who for a long time has been working with social housing. So many artists like that. Also theorists, we have the cultural geographer Doreen Massey, who talks very poignantly and personally about growing up in council housing, the British equivalent of social housing, in the 1940s in the UK, and how growing up in a social house, a house that is that's provided by the government, by people that don't have much money, shaped her politics and her thinking. The way that she thinks about cartographies of power in the world is shaped directly by growing up in a council house in Manchester in the 1940s in the UK. So we're very interested in these things. We also have Neil Smith writing about securitization, so from the local to the kind of global conceptual. We also have Manuel Castells, Amalia Cardenas, and Joanna Connell talking very much about how alternative economies are also part of the way in which we might rethink um, the ways in which we organize social housing for ourselves and our colleagues and the people that we live and work with when we think about developing cities and urban structures. So there's lots and lots of fantastic um, material in the book, and of course I encourage you all to read it. But I want, before going on for too long, to introduce Teddy, and I need to take my crib, ship, sh crib sheet because he has so many awards and plaudits, <laughs> so I'm going to have to read this. But Teddy Cruz is, as I'm sure you all know, um, the founding uh, architect of uh, Studio, uh, um, uh, uh, Studio Teddy Cruz, which is based in San Diego and also a professor of urban planning and art. Oh, I'm going to get this right. The specific title is a professor. Hang on. So it is um, Professor of Public Culture and Urbanism at the University of California, San Diego. And of course, even in that title, one begins to see some very interesting contradictions and, and the idea of bringing different fields together and thinking about how you can do it. Um, Teddy has received norm, nu numerous awards, so including the Rome Prize for Architecture, the Ford Foundation Visionaries Award, the Global Award for Sustainable Architecture by French National Museum of Architecture, and his research has also been included in many exhibitions, um, many, many exhibitions. An exhibition, we've been talking last night about how exhibitions are a format for thinking through ideas and how they are. Um, Teddy probably is best known in uh, kind of Biennale territory for curating the 2008 um, American pavilion, in the US pavilion in uh, the architecture, the Venice Architecture Biennale. And also most recently his work has been featured in uh, the exhibition Small Scale Big Change at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Okay, but I mean, that's the kind of official stuff. And now the important stuff, which is that what Cruz, uh, what he does um, is develop this extraordinary relationship at a very local level in San Diego between sites of political sites of transformation along the border between Mexico and the US. So this idea of thinking through how constructing and planning and the politics of planning very, very local Urban, trans, uh, urban social planning and urban social housing projects can have vast political ramifications. And this is, so through working with these very specific sites on the border, the very politicized and disputed and contested border between Mexico and the US, these sites of social housing, how to construct housing, how to use the construction of housing to affect and afford political change over a period of time, Teddy has been working on this project for 12 years now, is um, exactly the kind of question and the kind of practice we want to interrogate in our social housing project, which is why we were absolutely thrilled when he agreed to write the foreword for our book and are very, very pleased to welcome him here to talk about his work today. Teddy Cruz, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Yes. Let's see if I can... I take this microphone then? Yeah. I will just stand as well. Thank you, Andrea, for the introduction. Uh, it's so fantastic to actually be part of this conversation and, and 
this conversation be an excuse also to come to Documenta, so thank you very much for this. Uh, Andrea and Fulvia, thank you for including me in this fantastic project. I don't have that much time to tell you many stories, you know, that I, I was actually am uh, intending to do primarily, to tell you about how this particular territory that Andrea was mentioning earlier uh, produced a kind of uh, shift in, 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 in my practice, in a sense. I mean, how these territories of conflict begin to reorganize uh, in, in a, a way of uh, acting, let's say, in terms of our own procedures uh, across our own fields. So um, primarily, I wanted to really put into the context of this a, a series of environments that I've been working uh, with in the last 12 years, in, in fact, across the border between Tijuana and San Diego, Tijuana, Mexico, San Diego, California, at a broader scale between Latin America and the United States. This has been the territory of my practice. But it's impossible to begin any conversation in our time, I think, without reflecting for a moment, even if briefly and, and um, impressionistically, let's say, for a moment in terms of the crisis that we occupy. And I think that even though this is, might be obvious to many of you, I keep reflecting that it is, in fact, the obvious quality of this uh, condition that really has us uh, almost paralyzed without really uh, enabling uh, uh, ways of transforming ourselves, but also the institutions. So uh, for me, it's essential uh, to reflect on this uh, amazing graph, or how would you call it, this statistical graph that I found recently in the New York Times. And I found these two lines to be incredibly poignant in visualizing really the condition of crisis, again, that we must continue reflecting on. Um, these two lines, uh, which in fact tell the story across, uh, well, from the 20s, 1928 to 2008. I mean, I find that almost every politician in the United States begins a speech by saying that this is the worst recession since the Great Depression. And for me, it was essential to begin reflecting what this means. And obviously, this graph really, again, uh, uh, exposed this uh, uh, drama. Uh, these two lines uh, definitely uh, uh, explain that the the current uh, uh, recession is definitely very similar to 1928, precisely because at those two moments in recent history, the last 100 years or so, uh, we have uh, witnessed the conflation for a moment between what is the top line, the largest income inequality, the concentration of economic power uh, from the many into the very few, but also paired with the lowest taxes on the wealthy in history. So this, two, this gap is definitely at those uh, two extremes. But what I began to reflect out of this uh, statistical uh, graph is that we very seldom talk about what uh, happened after each of those moments, each of those moments of crisis. And for me, it was incredibly uh, um, surprising, in fact, to find that that middle zone that you see there, where those two lines begin to approximate, to really inquire what happened during those, uh, those decades. It was clear that the, uh, after the, uh, the Great Depression in 1928, even though the economic power was concentrated in, into the very few, let's say, for a moment, nevertheless, the political power had the uh, will, let's say, to re uh, uh, reorganize itself by, in fact, beginning to engage once more uh, what I would call the kind of public imagination. In a sense, the New Deal emerged in the United States. FDR uh, sets into motion what is called the WPA, the Works Progress Administration, a kind of investment in culture, art, infrastructure begins to be mobilized. The Second Bill of Rights is presented by 1944. Uh, this is not, there is no time to really articulate further on that, but if you have the time, really look for it. The document is incredibly impressive, uh, this Second Bill of Rights, that in a sense uh, brings together uh, what loosely speaking uh, might be the kind of uh, uh, the synergies between civil society, philanthropic uh, kind of spheres and, and government in the United States. We all know also that this period, where, while I am amplifying it as a moment of uh, a very different paradigm, we all know that also this period was uh, characterized by the kind of debt financing or financed uh, infrastructural growth that ultimately paved the way to suburbanization in the United States and therefore to uh, the current crisis. But nevertheless, what I want to focus on is in the possibility of investment in public infrastructure, public education, and ultimately public housing with such very in the United States during those decades. We all know that by the beginning of the 80s, this begins to shift, and the privatization of public resources begins to once more be the paradigm that paves the way to our current crisis. We might say that in that middle zone, there was a, a more equitable redistribution of resources. We might say that maybe the 1% was 35%, and then 99% uh, was maybe more like 65%. Nevertheless, we all know 
obviously that by 2006 this had been inflated to again mobilize these resources to be concentrated into uh, the hands of the very few in the United States and worldwide for that matter. We all know by, by 2008, this economy burst seemingly, uh, producing what I uh, many times reflect, my, primarily from the United States point of view, the kind of falsehood. It reveals, finally, the falsehood of a sort of trickle-down economics. You know, in the United States, there is this paradigm still that by detaxing de the wealthy, somehow that wealth will touch each of us. I think that uh, primarily this is revealed, the kind of falsehood of this democratic model that amplifies the American dream as the almighty right to be left alone. So this sort of notion of the kind of crisis of the collective uh, is once more presented to us. But fi uh, finally, I, uh, which is part of the, uh, the foreword in the introduction to this book that I was uh, invited to, to write, I reflect on it as I, what I call, after 2008, the three slaps on the face of the American public. Uh, in a sense, uh, uh, this is a very clear kind of um, if in, in my mind, a, a crisis, uh, but, but by that I mean uh, the 99 percent, uh, in this case, the American public for a moment, comes to the rescue of the, very, of the architects themselves of the crisis in the shape of the Wall Street bailouts. I call this the first slap on the face of the American public, uh, uh, prompted by this sort of mobilization uh, uh, by the crisis, let's say. In the United States, again, there is a kind of consolidation of a minority of very radical right-wing factions, let's say for a moment, that, present, that has such a dominance in the kind of political lobbying machine that really begins to propose uh, uh, the kind of um, millions of foreclosures at the end. I mean, what I'm trying to suggest is that you would imagine that while while the public is bailing out the architects of the crisis, at least in exchange we would get the guarantees to maintain uh, the American dream in the shape of house owner, housing ownership. But no, in a sense, those guarantees were never really set into motion, producing millions of foreclosures and, and major unemployment in the United States. This is what I call the, the, the second slap on the face of the American public. And finally, this really uh, consolidates itself, this sort of uh, erasure of public institutions in the shape uh, of a kind of withdrawal, let's say, from the kinds of uh, the kind of commitment to a kind of public project, as Fulia was saying earlier, in unprecedented public spending cuts, the kind of austere economic plans that now are set into motion because now we all need to sacrifice, right? So this, I think, is a third final slap on the face in the American public, is, uh, presenting us uh, really the nature of the crisis, the kind of shrinking relevancy of the public at, at, in our very at this very moment, while of course the one percent, generally speaking, because one percent is a very strange uh, condition, but nevertheless, for the sake of impressionistic or kind of drama, I could say the one percent remains untouched, undented, unaccountable, and I think it is this, in fact, consolidation in uh, in our time, very different from after 1928. Not only the consolidation of uh, economic power, but primarily of political power where the institutions seem unable to rethink and reform themselves. This is what I mean by the cultural crisis. In fact, we all know it's an environmental and an economic crisis, but primarily it's a crisis of the institutions that are, again, unable to mobilize different procedures, uh, uh, different uh, ways of acting. So, uh, in a sense, uh, I, I couldn't uh, uh, avoid beginning by really reflecting on this, but also by very pointedly suggesting that the crisis continues to be one of inequality. Not only the kind of disparity in terms of economic uh, resources, but also the disparity of opinions that has uh, uh, dramatized the gap between institutions and the public. So the need to really engage this disparity of uh, points of view, let's say, the mobilization of new bodies of knowledge also are essential in our time because it's in fact that inequality that has uh, dramatize at the same time the gap between wealth and poverty. We all know that the glamorous, the glamorous urbanization that we witnessed in the last 15 years also produced unprecedented marginalization. And it is that uh, kind of um, uh, gap that really was produced by what I call uh, the, the, the installing of these in exclusive institutions. The exclusion that is produced by the kind of, again, uh, uh, convergence or the, the, the kind of gap that exists between enclaves of wealth, of mega wealth. You know, I come from San Diego where we can see some of the wealthiest real estate uh, 
barely 20 minutes away from some of the poorest settlements in Latin America. So this, on the Tijuana side, on the Mexico side, this radical proximity of wealth and poverty. Of course, these conditions of crisis and conflict have always been materialized in the territory. So many times when I see this border wall, which is the, the, the steel wall that separates uh, San Diego from Tijuana, I uh, meditate on this wall as being uh, the wall that transforms San Diego into the world's largest gated community. And in a sense, I'm realizing that the hardening of the border wall at the San Diego-Tijuana border continues to happen in tandem with the hardening of social legislature towards the city, the erosion of cultural institutions, of public institutions, but also the ones that perpetuate the division of communities and jurisdictions out of this urbanization of fear, of exclusion and separation. I've been interested in really documenting the kind of trans-border flows across this formidable barrier, across socioeconomic uh, kind of invisible transactions in the territory. And in a sense, uh, uh, through the observation and documentation of these flows across people, resources, begin to reimagine what housing could be. And that's primarily in the context of this book, of course. Understanding conflict itself as a creative tool, the necessity to really expose the visualization of conflict, what produced the crisis in the first place, the conditions that produced it become the material for the artist in that sense. The kind of, it's impossible to talk about social housing as a designer without understanding the mortgage crisis, the kind of financial and political institutions that have really produced it. So in my mind, this is where maybe a, a kind of um, interesting conception of the political emerges at the very collision between the formal and the informal, formal institutions, top-down forces of urbanization, and the sort of invisible bottom-up uh, types of ecological, social, and economic conditions that exist at this uh, border or this juncture. So on one hand, I've been interested in the flow of people moving from south to north, of course, and on the other, the flow of waste moving from north to south at the, in the United States. So in San Diego, in Tijuana, right, uh, from San Diego, an incredible flow of debris, of urban debris, of urban leftovers, of waste in the shape of these, for example, this post-war bungalow. So these are small houses, typical of the kind of post-war levy towns that uh, define a a any subdivision in, in the United States. These small houses uh, are brought to the border waiting to cross the border. So these are houses that are waiting to cross the border, not only people cross the border, but entire pieces from one city to another. So when these houses cross the border, they are uh, arrive to Tijuana and they are put on top of these metal frames, elevated, leaving the first floor to become the second, to be injected with more economies or maybe alternative programming. I call this a sort of club sandwich urbanization, uh, the kind of fearless uh, contact of opposites uh, that begins to recycle again the, the, the waste of one city into the other. Uh, not only houses, of course, but small debris, uh, small uh, pieces of infrastructure such, such as these rubber tires. I'm, I'm sure many of you have seen these images through time of how people use these rubber tires to construct retaining walls. But look at how now people begin to out of uh, socioeconomic emergency, begin to stitch these tires in very intelligent ways by, uh, uh, by uh, folding them and clipping them into a more functional uh, system. So an object, a unit, again, becomes a system. It's like an incredible kind of uh, uh, lesson uh, uh, that uh, as architect, I cannot avoid being seduced by the kind of creative intelligence embedded in these uh, environments of crisis but uh, without romanticizing poverty, because never, nevertheless, this is a place that is a, a place of urgency, uh, there are other procedures that are of, of interest to me. Uh, the garage doors that are exported again in, uh, from San Diego into Tijuana, and these garage doors begin to construct entire uh, social housing in these slums that dot the periphery of Tijuana. Again, the kind of bricolage, the, 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 again, the drama of one city building itself with the waste of the other is unavoidable too. Again, this is an incredible phenomenon. So imagine the levy towns of Southern California uh, dismantling themselves in the last 30, 40 years in their waste build, uh, building the new periphery of Tijuana, 20 minutes south. Levy town has been recycled into Tijuana's informal settlements. So for me, again, just to clarify what I meant earlier about this issue of uh, avoiding the romanticization of poverty because the informal as a, co a category has, brought back, has been brought back to our discussion. I want to amplify it not as an aesthetic category, 
but in fact as a praxis. In other words, behind these types of pr procedures, there is not only the, the kind of seduction of these images, but there is an operative dimension of informality. What I mean is that has, what has been of interest uh, to my practice has been the translation the kind of interpretation of many of these procedures that are embedded in this informal uh, urbanization. The negotiation of boundaries, uh, the uh, negotiation of resources, the kind of social organizational systems that really are at play, whether of dominance, but also of collaboration. Many of these invisible transactions need translation, and I think that has been a site uh, for my practice really to occupy. But also, uh, again, the notion that behind these procedures, there is a praxis. Uh, I'm interested in amplifying that aspect of the informal out of these procedural methodologies, right, that by which uh, uh, systems are really uh, set into motion. Uh, for example, of course, behind these images, what is important is the political economy of waste. So uh, the garage doors, the tires, many of those systems are really part of a market economy within these environments that also are paired with social organization. It's, there is, this is not time to really elaborate on some of these issues, but let it, uh, it's enough maybe to suggest that I'm interested in really the visualization of those very process-based type of dynamics embedded in the informal. Uh, but also, uh, uh, for every project we, we do uh, in this context, in this very contested territory, we, we try to identify a conflict. In the case of Tijuana, uh, the conflict that really uh, was of importance was the conflict between factories, labor, and housing, precisely because we wanted to uh, understand further the political economy of waste embedded in this construction of housing, in a sense. So the site of intervention became the factory itself. As an architect, you would imagine that we want to rush to the slum to sort of solve the problem by building more houses, but we wanted to instead take a detour. For me, it has been an important aspect, these sort of detours that one must take in order to contact the domains that have been peripheral to art practice or to architecture in this case. And so we went to the factories, understanding that these factories in the city of Tijuana in Mexico, being one of those uh, sort of uh, tax havens, in a sense, for multinationals that come from Asia, uh, to uh, enable the assembly of televisions and beyond. These factories place themselves next to the slums uh, so that they can borrow cheap labor in, uh, without having to invest anything in return. So we decided to occupy this very particular conflict by presenting a very clear equation. The factories get labor, can the factories give something back uh, out of their uh, uh, production and material systems, let's say for a moment, by pairing also the kind of sweat equity, the kind of labor uh, that is embedded in these slums. In other words, these slums are factories of social housing because people build their own infrastructure in their own housing and so on. How to begin to, uh, again, intervene in other sites uh, to rethink social housing and to enable a very different role for an architect who not only wants to design buildings but also collaborations, also the kind of interface across institutions, publics, and in particular aspects of governance. Uh, so from these materials that the factory already has, we began to alter them very lightly to produce uh, uh, infrastructural systems that could be adapted in, in these environments, let's say, to begin supporting uh, the evolution, let's say, the time-based evolution of these uh, housing conditions, such as this uh, portable uh, space frame that is injected into some of these existing environments uh, to rethink again their own organization. Uh, or the gutter beam that is a, a structural system that collects water as well. But it's again a kind of acupunctural uh, set of parts that insert themselves into the precariousness of these environments. Or this pallet rack system, which is prim primarily the system that this factory produces, exporting it all over the world, how to alter its constitution so that it can become a hinge mechanism uh, to uh, enable the stitching of waste in other ways as well. So again, the condition of rethinking infrastructure uh, through um, social organization. I thought that this was one aspect that hadn't been in part of our conversation in the world of urbanism and architecture. The connection of the formal and the social in this case. Uh, so these parts begin to be assembled again uh, in order to stitch not only the tires, but the joists, the, 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 the kind of recycled parts, the houses, into systems that can be more coherently visualizing the transactions across public and private environments and so on, but also seemingly just producing support systems again. 
uh, into uh, these evolutionary processes that characterize these, these slums. Uh, so this sort of a scaffold, let's say, for living that uh, it transforms itself uh, through time, moving from the ephemeral uh, uh, conditions of housing to the more permanent infrastructural systems. Um, so of interest, again, is the, the socioeconomic contingency uh, that happens in these environments, and how can they be the devices to rethink housing. Uh, so in that sense, uh, the major part of my practice is really in San Diego, California, where I've been interested in understanding the impact of immigrants in the transformation of the American neighborhood. Uh, so that's what I mean, again, the kind of social and economic contingencies that begin to transform the environments themselves of the contemporary city. So I've been trying to visualize some of these transactions or operations, let's say, in a series of very simple maps, this one, or stories. This one is called the Non-Conforming Buddha. I've been interested in the narrativization of re the retrofitting of spaces by immigrants in the United States. So imagine at the most trafficked border of the world, uh, San Diego, Tijuana, not one single land use map exists between these two cities as they repel each other, as they ignore each other in, in, in the rethinking of infrastructure. So I had to splice it in this very simple image. Uh, to the north, you see the, 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 the large pieces of color of land use conditions in Southern California that tend to separate uses, of course. Entire uh, bedroom communities, the smallest sliver of retail in the shape of malls, etc. And to the south, you see the pixelation of more compacted alternative uses in Tijuana. So my argument has been that this uh, confetti of illegal uses has begun to infiltrate itself into the largeness of Southern California. Uh, this is a kind of double destiny of Levittown because on one hand Levittown was recycled into Tijuana and on the other whatever is left over, uh, immigrants have begun to uh, alter it, to retrofit it out of this urbanization of adaptation. Uh, in transformation, because when that confetti hits the ground in many of the older neighborhoods of Southern California, they begin to change and alter the constitution, let's say, of the, the small parcels that were occupied by one house with a lot of wasted space around, in a sense, and they begin these parcels to be transformed out of informal economies so that maybe there might be a small business plugged into a garage illegally, or maybe the construction of a granny flat to support an extended family also illegally. I think these transactions with the space begin to produce this amazing uh, densification out of socioeconomic, again, informalities. So uh, one of those houses, which is the informal Buddha that I've been documenting, has to do with the story of one of those post-war bungalows that did not travel to Tijuana but was transformed 30 years ago by a, a group of uh, monks into a Buddhist temple. And the transformation of this house is not only interesting typologically, but what is interesting is how this house now becomes an agency that these actors, these agents begin to, to negotiate with the neighborhood the translation of many of these informal economies and densities, but also the distribution of knowledge, the kind of um, exchange, let's say, of pedagogical and cultural programming with the neighborhood. I'm interested in the role of these uh, agencies at, at neighborhood scales that begin to take a role of a kind of informal city halls that really uh, bundle that kind of uh, consolidate the kind of energies that are invisible to the planning institutions in many of these cities. Uh, so this presents something that is very important in the context of this conversation, that while the city, the global city, was catapulted uh, as a kind of place of consumption, a kind of urbanism of consumption, many of these margi marginal neighborhoods all over the world remain sites of production of cultural and socioeconomic production, one can argue. I would like to confront that. Urbanisms of consumption versus urbanization of production, as we begin to notice that in these neighborhoods, density was really, uh, operationally, was conceived differently that, to the institutions. For the institutions, density is just a, a, a quest to a very abstract uh, construct. An amount of things per acre, right? An amount of people per acre. In many of these neighborhoods, in fact, this is the equation, right? Amount of things in the territory. In these neighborhoods, uh, one can cancel and, and challenge this equation by suggesting that density, in fact, is the opposite. It's an amount of socioeconomic exchanges per acre. And this, for me, was essential, an essential opening in the discussion. And of course, uh, once more, the, the role and the kind of value of this socioeconomic contingency in rethinking housing.
Also, for, of, of course, in the United States at this very moment, which is not different from Europe, I, probably here is even worse, I think, this sort of fear of the immigrant, right? So for me, it has been essential to suggest that this urbanization of adaptation and transformation that invites us to rethink how we organize housing is also presenting to us a very different conception of citizenship. That citizenship is primarily a creative act that reorganizes institutional protocols in the spaces themselves of the city. And I'm thinking again, the role of immigrants in many of these neighborhoods could begin to be presented as the DNA to reimagine policy, to reimagine land use and, and economic kind of frameworks. Uh, so I'm interested in conveying through this uh, research the possibility of an urbanization beyond the property line that is embedded really in these sort of protocols, right, of exchange uh, in the seeking of other economies. I think that it's essential in our time to talk about this unavoidably, even though we should have been talking about this uh, already years ago, but I don't want to suggest uh, other economies as just alternative economies. I think that I'm interested in injecting into the official economic protocols uh, uh, the, the kind of ambiguity of many of these informal transactions. By that I mean my set of op operation in many of the projects we are developing in California attempt to inject into the developer's spreadsheet the very economic models, the knowledge uh, of the developer to be co-opted, let's say, or to be altered by many of these uh, informalities. So let's imagine the, developer, the developer's uh, uh, business plan. I don't know how you call it in Europe, but in the United States we call it the developer's you know, spreadsheet or pro forma. How do we inject the, the kind of uh, informal economies as two uh, women uh, rent a three-bedroom apartment, transforming it into an illegal nursery and how this activity can be injected into a nonprofit organization that is located in the neighborhood so that the nonprofit can really politically and economically represent that invisible activity? Or can we think of how sweat equity, which is very alive in many of these neighborhoods, can be part also of a very different conception of housing uh, by bartering or by exchanging, let's say, social service uh, for rent or co-ownership, et cetera? There is no time here to really elaborate on many of these cases that have been, uh, that are very much concrete in these environments and that begin to again invite us to rethink the very economic models that uh, uh, compose uh, um, development. In essence, what I'm trying to convey is the need uh, to rethink conditions of property. It's essential in our time. Of course, we all know that the mortgage crisis was what, what uh, seemingly catapulted this crisis today. And therefore, I think uh, embedded in those transactions, there is a kind of knowledge that we need to really recuperate ourselves as artists and as architects. So other conditions of uh, ownership or property, can the economic pro forma of the developer be an instrument to construct community? That has been one of the most provocative sort of statements that has emerged from, from our research. And by that I mean, I think as artists and architects, we need to really steal the knowledge, right, of those uh, procedures to really uh, reorganize it so that the profit or the benefit is to the communities uh, uh, that really are part of these neighborhoods. So my, my research really has gone through a process that probably begins with the understanding of this impact of these informal densities and economies translated into particular typologies in many of these neighborhoods and then in collaboration with nonprofit organizations that are based in these neighborhoods begin to design political and economic process that then later is specialized into new models of housing. That has been uh, our interest in suggesting that as architects, uh, uh, primarily in our time, we must say that the future of the city depends less on buildings at this moment and more on the fundamental reorganization of socioeconomic relations in that a political and economic protocols can be designed. And in that sense, it is that partnership with these nonprofits to design political process understanding the neighborhood as a political unit, let's say, for a moment, has been a in, in very interesting uh, uh, task, let's say, in terms of design. How to design social contracts uh, that can assure levels of justice, uh, levels of protection at the same time uh, being specialized, uh, and so on. There is, again, no time uh, to elaborate on this, but one particular instrument has been the designing of this micro-policy at the scale of these neighborhoods primarily with this nonprofit organization located in the border neighborhood of San Isidro next to the checkpoint in San Diego in the United States, and an entity, an agency called Casa Familiar, where we presented to the municipality of San Diego 
a, a micro policy and a particular economic model so that this neighborhood could begin to develop its own housing uh, by reorganizing existing protocols. I'm interested in working with the existing frameworks as supposed to imagine an alternative world somewhere else that would just create one more island in an archipelago of, of fragmentation. So I'm, I'm interested in the infiltration into the institutions. So in that case, uh, the presentation to the municipality of San Diego of the nonprofit as a new type of agency, as an informal city hall, uh, create a rethinking its role. So one of them was uh, to map illegality, imagine this, to in fact in, uh, uh, insert into the official map of the city all those illegal additions and economies that are part of this neighborhood, while the nonprofit would protect the need for invisibility of many of, the, of those people. Uh, but nevertheless, by mapping many of these alterations, we could begin to argue for a kind of commonsensical urbanism, okay? The, that in, in one parcel, uh, in, in these very suburban environments, we can find the coexistence of three small units of housing uh, that could be illegal in a sense. Uh, again, it's a very complex process, but this also involved uh, educational models. I'm interested very much on the kind of urban pedagogical models to in fact in intervene in, the, in that gap between cultural institutions and public. So we had to uh, summon the community in a very different way to qu ask the questions. What is density? Uh, what is a style? Uh, what is housing? What is mixed use? And so on. Um, uh, many interesting stories emerge from this contact with the community. Uh, but for example, as this uh, woman told me in this workshop, can density be neighborhood collaboration or can density be measured by spaces, not objects? And, and, and th there, is, th there were very interesting con concepts that really emerged out of this uh, uh, a, a process. Uh, so the idea that the nonprofit uh, really facilitates construction permits so that the municipality give, gives power to these small entities to create partnerships with many of these uh, residents in this community who are illegal, but the nonprofit really represents them. I'm, I'm very much convinced that something that is needed in our time is new political representation. And these agencies begin to really take that role. Uh, uh, so the residents be become, in a sense, co-developers with the nonprofit uh, of the extra units that can really be part of these small parcels. Uh, and finally, uh, the idea that in these uh, neighborhoods we can find also the possibility of uh, a small scale development that does not really deal with the, 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 the huge towers that we can really aspire to in the kind of densification of the city, but in these areas of suburban, suburban life in the United States, we can speak of transitional density. So by that I mean that also the nonprofit begins to facilitate construction um, sort of uh, lending in very different ways by breaking apart the kind of large loans and, and uh, subsidies that uh, the government uh, gives to these developers. So the nonprofit becomes a representative, let's say, of many of these uh, packages, prepackaging financial systems, let's say, that can be then later distributed through the neighborhood. Uh, so this, uh, in a sense, for me, this has been an incredible uh, uh, diagram that the architect injects, in, uh, we, we inject ourselves in the middle of those transactions, right, by renegotiating uh, institutional um, synergies and, and conversations, in a sense. Um, parcels are conceived as micro socioeconomic systems. Let me finish with a couple of images here pertaining this, because a lot of this is also spatialized, and I'm realizing that these slides have uh, time, they are time-based. Uh, but uh, it begins with, uh, the, it's, it's, these are developments that are happening in the small parcels uh, so that the nonprofit be, has begun to acquire these small parcels. This one has an old church that is retrofitted into an incubator of cultural programming and social programming. Um, then uh, we inject these small um, rooms that are uh, basically equipped with collective kitchens and electricity. So the church and the rooms become the kind of uh, social uh, service infrastructure within which then housing is injected. This is a, a typology that looks at um, a single mothers with children that is threaded into these rooms so that the residents uh, collaborate with the nonprofit organization in co-managing and co-owning many of these resources. Uh, a duplex that is given to two artists who work with social practice so that there is an exchange of social service for rent but also with the idea that there is a social contract between the artists, the residents, and the nonprofits, so that the artists collaborate 
uh, with the residents of the community to co-produce projects. I'm interested in challenging uh, certain aspects of social practice that only have amplified the community symbolically but not operationally. So the idea here is how to co-own and co-manage these resources. At the other end of the uh, parcel, uh, larger units with la large kitchens uh, for families who live with grandmothers so that they, they also uh, enable a kind of collaboration with the nonprofit to incentivize small economies. And finally, a typology that has to do with the small sheds for alternative flexible uses for extended families. So in a, it's a small parcel, we create what it is a coexistence of different housing economies but also with a series of social, pedagogical, and cultural programming that is curated by residents, the nonprofit, and artists and architects. So it's an aspiration to suggest, again, that the challenge of our time in terms of the, anti the densification of the city depends on the kind of um, rethinking of zoning, particularly, right? That zoning has remained a kind of punitive tool that prevents socialization when, in reality, through these small projects, we're amplifying that zoning while necessary, it should be a generative tool to organize activity and ultimately economy at the scale of neighborhoods for their sustainability. So these are small pieces of infrastructures that are injected as plug, plug uh, support systems into housing can be choreographed across a very intelligent uh, socioeconomic and cultural programming uh, 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 out of these collaborations. And finally, um, uh, let me just finish then uh, two more minutes with this. Uh, the notion of the democratization of urban development. That's what I'm trying to suggest. And by that, I, I not only mean the need to reorganize resources and redistribute resources, but also redistribute knowledges. And I think that there is something about the kind of creative knowledge embedded in these informalities that really uh, is inviting us to uh, reorganize housing itself, uh, but also the urgency to inject ourselves also into that pedagogical process to what degree we enter into the very debate, uh, at least in the United States, of the mythology of the American dream. This has been an important uh, question for myself. So re recently, let me finish with this uh, project. I was invited to go to uh, South Korea, to the city of Anyang, uh, for a, a biennial, one of those biennials having to do with uh, intervention into public domain. Uh, uh, and uh, I called it conversations on coexistence. And here I am in the office of the mayor uh, with the curator of the event on the 23rd floor of one of those towers you know, in Anyang. And as I look close to the window, I see in the distance these small houses that reminded me of California in a sense, this sort of bucolic landscape in the hills and so on. But when I get close to the window, I see that these were just the top, kind of the, the tip of what was really this uh, uh, huge uh, sort of, again, homogenizing uh, vertical housing. And so I realized, my God, I say, I come from the place where that happens horizontally, right? This sort of horizontal sprawl of sameness. Here is a kind of vertical uh, reproduction of that, uh, of those gated communities. And so, of course, obviously, the conflict here is between those new towns that are emerging uh, and those older neighborhoods that are being demolished. Uh, in fact, this is a neighborhood that I engaged in the project in Anyang, uh, which is going to be demolished to build this uh, new town. And obviously, this conflict between the vertical and the horizontal when it comes to housing is something that continues to be a challenge. I, mean, I don't know if you remember this uh, image you know, of this uh, uh, development in China where this crater, I mean, this, uh, uh, this huge hole that is really for the foundations of this huge tower uh, has in its middle the last house of the neighborhood that was demolished, you know, the house of this lady. So for me, I think, again, here is evidence of this uh, notion of the political that only emerges out of the collision, the kind of forceful collision of top down and bottom up, but also of this conflict between the vertical and the horizontal. So the project that we proposed in Anyang had to do with making physical models of the neighborhoods, the five neighborhoods that were going to be demolished in the next five years. Uh, and we wanted to make these models extremely lyrical with all, every single detail. So we engage uh, uh, elementary school children and uh, university students and activists in these neighborhoods to the construction of these, of these models, using them, the models themselves, as mediating tools to generate a conversation across a variety of stakeholders in the politics of housing in Anyang. So we went literally to the streets to build these models to begin measuring these spaces uh, with many of these activists. And as the models were being built, 
we were really producing conversations having to do with the need to understand the performance of those neighborhoods. Because even the activists were incredibly ignorant of how those spaces operated economically, socially, and politically. So we began to understand the kind of crisis of knowledge uh, as well in these uh, processes of activism. As we were uh, building these environments, we were also trying to document and animate some of these uh, models uh, to just really uh, enable the kind of uh, drama like, so in terms of the conversation, because literally this is what is happening and what would happen to this neighborhood, the kind of production of these uh, systems. And at the same time, we were documenting incredible informal, again, uh, uh, agency in these neighborhoods. This was the case uh, of, a, of a person who had a snail farm on four, uh, five rooftops in this neighborhood, and he also had produced a, a very interesting model of cooperation uh, at the scale of the block. So again, these sort of modes of governance, social organization, political representation, and economy embedded in these environments, but nobody was talking about it, right? They remain invisible not only to the institutions of planning, but to the activists themselves. Uh, there are other cases, there is no time here to elaborate. Uh, but the models, uh, we circulated them again through what we uh, thought were the main stakeholders in the production of these environments, the activists, the architects themselves of the towers, uh, the mayor's office and the development companies, and even the Catholic Church, which is really the epicenter of resistance in Anyang and so on. Uh, what I'm trying to suggest, again, to finalize uh, this brief, brief presentation, is the need to produce a new political language, uh, because uh, we wanted to engage a kind of intervention into the debate itself uh, that really uh, um, opened up to us that there was a lot to be debated and a lot of uh, sort of missing information that needed to be amplified in order to have a more intelligent conversation. I'm very much with Chantal Mouffe when she has proposed this sort of agonistic model of intervention that really treats public space as a kind of battleground uh, where the, how would I call it, the kind of hegemonic power of institutional economy and, and politics is visualized. Uh, so the intervention is in the debate itself and by circulating these again devices, the models themselves acting as tools uh, for uh, mediation and engaging of this new political language, we produced a, ultimately a kind of bill of rights for the neighborhood. Uh, the language was very clear and very simple that the activists then generated at the end of the project. The right of the neighborhood to enable the coexistence of different economies of housing, the right of the neighborhood to develop incrementally at different speeds of growth, the right to share the profits of urbanization, enabling local modes of production, the right to retrofit itself, enabling a small and inclusive development and so on. Ironically, many of these uh, 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 statements coincided very much with the second bill of rights of FDR that I began today with. So I guess it's a kind of uh, 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 common sense. In essence, uh, the invitation for me at least, and I'm making that I guess to us in this debate, how do we move from the neutrality of the public to the specificity of protocols in this case? This is something that a conversation that I had with Okwi Ewenso recently in San Diego when we were pondering that in fact one of the most emblematic images of the civil rights movement in the United States was that moment when Rosa Parks sat in the seat that did not belong to her. At that time the boss was public but it was not accessible to everyone. So I think this notion of moving from the neutrality of the public to the specificity of rights, I think is something that uh, is a, a, a really amazing possibility because we can begin to argue that we need to design protocols that can uh, somehow close the gap between urban policy and public participation. I think that most, the, the most fundamental aspect of this crisis is a crisis of public participation at the same time. And uh, this, of course, uh, suggests the, the search for a new civic imagination. This is at the, at the core, I think, in rethinking many of these uh, models. Housing, infrastructure, of course, institutional processes. Sorry for rushing through this, uh, but I wanted to kind of give you a sampling of uh, this process. Uh, so thank you very much. We've got time, Teddy, if you wouldn't mind, we have time for a few questions, but... Yes, is, please, that would be great, is yes. The, what's the best way to do this? Uh, there are lots of questions. Maybe if we come up here and I can field questions. 
I've got lots of questions as well, but uh, yes. should we okay. sit down? I won't hog the floor. Yeah, yeah. There's a uh, number of questions. So could you, t could you, it would be really nice to know who you are as well. Sure. My name is Mary Lou Canote. I'm director of Laumeyer Sculpture Park in St. Louis, but I also used to live in Phoenix in Los Angeles. So mm. I really enjoyed your work over the last couple of decades. I'm wondering how much impact the violence in Mexico has had on some of the urban design in Tijuana. You know, it's a fundamental question because uh, this is something that has happened in, the, in recent years. Much of my research preceded the kind of uh, increasing of violence at the border. And of course, when I talk about the kinds of transactions that happen and that have inspired my practice, I only, and this, in this case, I only talk about people in one direction, waste on the other, but unavoidably, the drug uh, and the kind of exchange of weapons, money, drugs, drugs goes north and money and weapons goes south. The kind of dramatization of these uh, conditions have produced unprecedented violence at the border. And this is a, a, a topic that I don't talk that much about, but it's definitely uh, it's an essential part. My research recently, that's the reason I was saying, has been focusing on urban pedagogical models. I've been researching a lot what happened in Medellin, Colombia, for example, where Medellin a few years ago was the most dangerous city in the world and recently has been presented as one of the most creative environments that has transformed the institutions of planning uh, by rethinking infrastructure and by rethinking cult the culture as an instrument to, to fight, in fact, violence and in ignorance. Completely different paradigm from the United States or anywhere in the world. So I'm interested in entering into that dilemma as well. Of course, the main crisis in Tijuana because of the violence is the retreat of the public, right, from the spaces of the city and of the institutions. The institutions completely abandoned. This is what happened in Colombia in the 80s. And what happened in the 90s or in the 2000s is the institutions decided to fight back by entering into that environment uh, of violence. But I think that, again, uh, of primary preoccupation, again, for me, is the, in the United States at this moment, is the withdrawal from education uh, as, a, as a kind of device, again. I think that it is the time, primarily now, to really enable uh, education as, a, as an instrument to rethink much of, the, of this uh, crisis. So that, that's, that's where the project stands, is, is, is to work with, and I didn't have time today, but I've been working with um, events that really enable the awareness of this in terms of entering into those sites of conflict, for example. I recently uh, curated a, 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 an event called the Political Equator, I didn't, I didn't have time to really show that, but, but brings uh, of, uh, politicians, scholars, artists, activists into the size themselves of conflict to reorganize the conversation. Um, so anyway, there is a mobilization of that type of attitude in Tijuana, I think, at this moment. And I think art and the humanities can lead that conversation. But what is amazing about Latin America, Medellin, Colombia, all of these places that have transformed themselves so intelligently all of those projects were led by humanists, uh, by, by, by people from the humanities, the mayors from Medellin, philosopher, mathematician. It's really an interesting uh, aspect. I'm saying this because, you know, I work, I teach in a university, and the first, the first uh, departments that tend to really be excluded from the conversation is arts and humanities, because we seemingly are the flaky ones, right, that cannot contribute to the transformation of, of the political or the economic. Yeah, and we're also the ones that aren't making enough profit in the capitalization of the universities going on right now. Um, I, I think behind the guy that's filming, there was a, yes, thank you. Could you tell us who you are? Yeah, hi, uh, I'm Joe Hall from Simon Fraser University in Vancouver. Uh, thank you for your uh, talk. I just had a question around uh, some of the ideas that you uh, put forward, whether you see them uh, being related to the right to the city movement that's proliferated around North America and also do Lefebvre's notion of the, the right to the city? Definitely. Uh, obviously, the, the connection is there, and primarily with the notion that uh, the, 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 the kind of transformations happen, in this case, let's call it a kind of revolution, or um, the kind of prompting or the mobilizing of this counter project begins by understanding urbanization and the phenomenon of our urbanization. Um, and in conjunction, too, is that the rights to the city, in fact, that's the reason I, I, I call it the rights to the neighborhood, because uh, the, the city, in my mind, has been co-opted already by very specific recipes that are very difficult to counter, in a sense. Uh, 
It is at the scale of neighborhoods where very intelligent activism has begun to rethink the protocols where I think uh, there is a space to advance that, that whole conversation. Um, and in that sense, I'm, this would be a, a longer debate because I also have a, a critique of certain aspects of resistance in rethinking more epistemic, let's say, structural changes. I know that uh, David Harvey, who is a friend, and uh, other people would critique my position in suggesting uh, more modest changes in institutional mechanisms. And I'm, I'm, I'm being dissatisfied with, with the left at times that in, in this aspiration uh, for an idealization of the transformation of, of certain systems, we have uh, prevented those small uh, projects that are so alive and concrete in neighborhoods to really get to trickle up, you know, and, and transform it. So I'm interested in ways of infiltrating into institutions uh, and producing a more incremental, modest uh, transformations. But that, that can be problematic for many uh, people really arguing for the rights to the city. Uh, I'm, I'm, that's an open-ended question, but yes, this has been part of my debate with friends and, and, yeah. and behind these projects. Uh, and also in, in the book, Social Housing, Housing the Social, there's a lot of discussion of this concept of rights. Uh, Zoran Ayrich, who is sitting behind you, who contributes to the book, um, uh, has written a fantastic um, uh, chapter in the book that very much looks at the Lefebvrean concept of rights as it is played out in, very specifically, in Lefebvre's work in Belgrade um, and its, its contemporary kind of um, idioms, as I could say, but also very particularly a group of activists in Hamburg who have taken that concept of rights to the city, uh, the right to the city, Lefebvre's idea, and are, are really using it to oppose gentrification. Um, there was another question, was there? Yeah, uh, oh, so is this Roman? I can't quite see. Yeah. I recognize the hand. Maybe I can take Roman Vasser first, who's an artist who has also contributed to the book, Roman. Well, well I won't introduce myself, I've been introduced. But um, my question was really was whether there had been any discussion or thinking around um, once land values have been increased by the kind of work that you're doing, which invariably they could be viewed as being increased. It's sort of undeniable because a speculator will view it in that way. Uh, was there any thinking about the legal... Uh, terms under which land is owned either by individuals or common groups and this is really thinking around incorporation in order to kind of um, uh, defeat any speculative move moving in I just wonder yeah. you and talked I, about forms yes. you talk, talked about pro formas and I wondered if there was no and, yeah. and you know in fact that's the reason it's difficult you know to get to the specificity of this by rushing through the material but definitely what is behind the whole uh, project is to challenge some of those um, <clears throat> reductive, ultimately, recipes, ultimately, the type of gentrification, right, that uh, we need to counter. But instead of, um, how would I call it, treating it in the abstract, the idea here was to produce models by which residents of this community can co-own those profits. I mean, the idea that the residents partner with the nonprofit organization uh, is about that kind of social contract that is uh, produced that uh, enables a kind of protocol between them. Of course, that would suggest that maybe some of these people might not be able to sell their house and just move to the next neighborhood because there is into place a series of guarantees and a kind of levels of accountability and exchange. And it is in that nuanced transaction where I think much of the project uh, dwells. Uh, that ultimately prevents the kind of speculative project that, that, that paves the way for, for gentrification where those communities are not involved. So part of the project here is about inclusion and that a community can develop its own housing but only by making the residents participants in the, you know, in the development itself. And probably this is where maybe I differ with these issues of, uh, uh, that have come up back again with the rights to the city because uh, we tend to really see the whole uh, problematic, let's say, from a distance as an act of resistance or as an act of really th thinking that we need to produce an alternative model or a counter model. I'm thinking in this case for me it has been essential to enter into what I was saying earlier, into those existing protocols by, by reverting a bit their, um, their logic and in, 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 uh, reorganize or, re or um, locate the kinds of pro uh, profits in to, you know, in, in, to the neighborhood, in a sense, or to the community. Um, that also 
suggests very different typological in terms of housing uh, projects because we're talking about uh, private parcels that have public infrastructure uh, in that uh, create a kind of porosity of relationship. Alleys that become informal markets uh, and that the infrastructure that is uh, supported by the government is not really, in other words, the rethinking of infrastructure so that is given by the government and the infrastructure that is generated uh, by the neighborhood itself. In other words, a double economy of infrastructure begins to suggest also a very different idea of specificity, let's say, when it comes to uh, development. Thank you. Uh, I'm Marco Herster. I'm an artist and curator from New Orleans, and I'm on the faculty of Louisiana State University. Um, I'm wondering if you could give any examples that evidence um, conflict, tensions, that sort of the interjection of your projects in the community building and community response have either sparked or exacerbated and how they were negotiated or how you handled them to um, bring it back down. <laughs> yes, no, that's, that's if really, possible. That's <laughs> really a great, a, great, a, a great question. And in fact, you know, this is primary, a, 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 one of the most interesting places to really explore this issue of conflict because probably everything that I mentioned sounds a little bit too like pink, okay, in terms of like too, all of a sudden in this community is... Uh, <clears throat> too nice, too especially nice, yes. to someone uh, from New uh, Orleans. A, a, a lot of it has emerged, in fact, many of those spaces, uh, what I call the spaces of co-production, not only of, of housing, but also of knowledge, uh, are really uh, defined by, by certain tensions. It is in the, in the kind of debate itself, I think, that some of these issues emerge that are really interesting. Primarily the workshops that we've been devising. In other words, I'm interested in the designing of communicational systems. When I arrived to this neighborhood uh, 12 years ago, uh, where there was nothing, because that's part of the project too, is like we began a project where there was no process, no, you know, we had to begin building that whole uh, thing from scratch. But the workshops that we bega uh, began with this is a Hispanic community, okay? Mexican-Americans. Uh, uh, so when we began to talk about housing and many of these issues, uh, and we typically, right, we wanted to challenge the community-based designer who just comes to the communities in a kind of patronizing way, uh, ask the community what the community wants because we're afraid also of saying what we think about this and the community tells us what uh, it wants and then we go back to the office to design the drawing. This is the, the kind of awful process, I've been very critical of this, uh, kind of mutual patronizing in a sense. So when we began the workshops, of course when we asked the questions, what, what does the community want, uh, the responses were like incredible. I mean, they, they wanted a Costco, you know, one of those big box economies, uh, uh, painted with Aztec pyramids on the, you know, on the, on the, and I immediately realized how one of the most essential problems is how identity has been packaged out of, you know, this, uh, with this sort of iconographic, uh, even though those images are essential to the, you know, to the identity of these communities, they have prevented, again, the visual essential of other uh, conditions by which identity might be uh, spoken about. So we began to open up questions. I mean, we were not afraid of beginning to be pushy, let's say for a moment, in, in, in a kind of uh, two-way type of conversation. That's what we began, uh, I began to be interested in designing these interface systems. So we began to open up the fact that many of the transactions that many of these residents make with boundaries, let's say public and private, the way we're, they were building illegal markets on the alleys or the illegal constructions behind a house or the economy plugged into the garage, many of those transactions with resources, with you know, the kind of collaborative models were also devices to rethink identity. And it, it was just a very interesting uh, moment of tension, just to answer the question, where we really came to the realization that we needed to challenge our own cliches uh, from both ends, let's say, in exchanging opinions for a moment. Uh, but what began to emerge was a very different conception. We, we said, let's put a, a pause on style as the kind of emblematic uh, tool for identity. Uh, we're not interested in how buildings look for a moment. Let's try to understand how they perform. So this, and this performative dimension of space, which of course I am speaking with academic language here, but when it comes to the conversation with, with, in those workshops, produce an incredible debate. And this is what I'm saying, this lady that I presented briefly in my table when we were talking about, 
she's the one that realized that, uh, you know, she said, this is a selfish urbanization, she said, uh, of just made of houses that act as individuals. And she began to remember when she lived in Mexico, where similar to historic cities, the blocks are not made of individual houses, but they are made of larger buildings that have spaces, courtyards, let's say, corridors. I don't know. So in her mind, she began to visualize a very different idea uh, of density, in a sense, that was made of spaces, that was made of collaboration. And that open, that conversation and some of those initial workshops opened not only places of tension, that then it began to produce the type of knowledge that became the basis for the projects. I'm, I'm definitely very, you know, very uh, optimistic that that's really the project I want to engage further. That, 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 uh, all, that, all that missing information, let's say. Is there another question? Yeah, thank you. Oh, hello. Um, my name is Liz Bakuber. I'm from the Bauhaus University in Weimar. Oh, hi. hi, Teddy. <laughs> and we're collaborating on a workshop, an interdisciplinary and interfaculty workshop in September. So um, I'm very interested in what, was, what you'd begun to talk about the university as a laboratory. And a lot of the projects are still in a theoretical phase, but certain ones are being uh, actually implemented um, the universities in Germany, um, much like the Dutch government, <laughs> have changed and monies <coughs> for, um, for culture, for the arts, for any discipline that doesn't generate third-party monies are being dra dramatically cut and there's really no money left uh, to do certain kinds of projects. My question maybe has to do with, first of all, with the idea of the transition of theory to practice in the community. Um, how you finance those activities. I mean, I know the way that we finance them, but uh, California is famously bankrupt. Um, how do you um, manage to achieve so much? Are there, is there p p uh, industry that steps in to help you, so, for example, move those houses from San Diego to Tijuana or uh, yeah. Yeah, maybe you could talk about that transition from uni laboratory university to the laboratory of the community. Well, see, the, part of the issue has been that we have uh, also equally in a patronizing way think we have thought that those communities are incredibly precarious, that they don't have resources. And in fact, they, part of what I've been arguing is that that intelligence, that creative intelligence embedded there is not only a social intelligence, but an economic one too. And I think that the alternative economies and the informal type of Yes, economic models there really have been essential in, in creating what I call the kind of clever cross-subsidizing, okay, of, of uh, support systems. Um, the, plus the fact that these nonprofits are incredibly agile in, in understanding. In fact, the nonprofit I work with does not receive that much uh, support from the government, in fact, um, because the, part of the issue has been not to have to uh, to, you know, to get this support that comes with so many strings attached, as I say, right? And, and which part of the issue too is, is the challenging uh, of existing subsidy structures of, of grant-based type of research, because it comes with many strings attached that, that uh, prevent the type of, uh, you know, visualization of many of these uh, conditions. So it has been about, really the nonprofit understanding how it has been able to purchase land, how to cross subsidize, how to really pixelate the kind of funding that is really coming from a myriad you know, of, of, of places and how to organize that further. And in my case, it has been also to synergize community and university because I think that uh, one of the most important aspects has been not only the knowledge that moves from the theoretical to the, uh, to the practice, but also how the reality of those incredible, that, that incredible phenomena can uh, begin to also produce a new theory, right? I mean, how, how can, how can the, the knowledge, the political and social knowledge embedded in these environments can begin to infiltrate into the university? So I've also begun to produce uh, programs. One is called the Community Stations, where we began to produce new programs for the university where I teach, for example. One is called Public Scholarship, where basically I've uh, convinced the university to let some of these um, activists uh, co-teach with professors uh, because 
in, in fact, many of those activists do not have the credentials to teach in the university, but through these new types of protocols, supported by technology, by the way, we, we have a, a teleconferencing capability, so we began to plug technology in some of these nonprofits, so they become classrooms from which activists can uh, transfer knowledge uh, to the university and vice versa. By that I mean the types of grants that have benefited only one particular category now begin to enable also uh, the collaboration with community-based efforts uh, because they have an incredible set of um, sources that really uh, we have not really you know, enabled in a sense. So anyway, this sort of traffic and circulation you know, of, of bodies of knowledge but also in that sense producing new types of economic leverage uh, has been essential. And of course, it's unfortunate to say it, but yes, I have depended on my teaching at the university where I, in fact, convinced the university to let me have a laboratory embedded in the university where I have my practice. So it is about the triangulation of research, practice, and education that presented also a, di a very different model. I'd like to ask a question on, on the back of that, actually, because I think the financial conditions are incredibly important to constantly talk about alongside the artistic or planning, you know, the kind of aesthetic questions. But my question, and I think that the, the idea of the grant is in, when, in many ways, w one of the many ways in which we have been conditioned into thinking about what a public is. The grant is given to a group of people to do something on another group of people. Huh? And we, all of us have benefited in academia from this kind of thinking. But you talked about, um, I wanted you just to elaborate a little on um, the idea of the shift from what you described as the neutral public to a different modality of publics. And I'm aware of, the, I, I'm asking the question in the context of the critique of such um, cooperative procedures <coughs> by more radically um, left-wing positions, one could say, whereby um, there is um, uh, um, a call or a, a need or an urgency around the idea of presenting, you know, or, or forming alternative or counter publics. But I wondered if you could elaborate a little bit on the way in which you consider a kind of public subject emerging. You've talked about, um, you know, social, you know, public space as a form of knowledge production. You've talked about these very particular relationships and the agencies that, that are um, made through them in a sense. And I wondered if you could relate those practices to this concept, this problem of the public that we confront as, as the kind of mechanism that constructed the public is now, you know, kind of falling away rapidly economically and also politically. No, I think, I mean, the, of course the question is complex uh, because it's about also a kind of gradation, you know, because when we, on one hand it's an issue of scale, right, when we talk about the public, it tends to be a very abstract notion uh, at the very broad overarching kind of scale, but uh, I'm interested in probably on, there are maybe two or three uh, images that come to mind in the context of your question. One is the scale. Uh, by which a community or a kind of small public, if I can call it that, uh, summons itself around issues of concern. Right? This has been also been articulated recently. In other words, what constructs the public is a, uh, the, the preoccupation, let's say, the kind of engagement of an issue, of, of, of concern, of mutual um, uh, interest, uh, right, in a sense. Uh, and on the other is really a set of modalities that have to do with action-based type of procedures, where the political is a kind of anticipation of action, in a sense, by entering into the very political frameworks. By that I mean, when I mention the no moving from the neutrality of the public to the specificity of rights, is to really enter into the understanding of the protocols themselves uh, that enable accessibility or uh, participation. In essence, probably what I'm referring to is that I am not ready to throw the baby with the bathwater, as they say, because I know that embedded in current legislature, whether in the United States and primarily in Europe, where you have a legacy of a kind of social democratic models, embedded in the legislature there are traces of political fragments that can be resuscitated, that, can, that have been camouflaged, that have been hidden. And we need to get to the specificity of those fragments to really bring them back, back as evidentiary elements, you know, to construct or to reconstruct the public. In that sense, in the United States, there are, I'm, I'm researching this further, but community land trusts, uh, many devices that are part of the 
you know, the political institutions. And so I'm not ready to say to the institutions to fuck up, how to say that, to, you know, to fuck off or whatever. I'm, I'm just ready to negotiate a very different accessibility to knowledge because, uh, again, uh, that is there in many different ways. And, and I think that, that that has also produced a very different model of conversation in the community. The nonprofit in this case is incredibly fantastic because you don't imagine the kind of, the, 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 the you know, loads of, every time there is a discussion in the city hall about that implicates this neighborhood, the nonprofit organizes trips, full, buses full of people to be present, you know, to be, to participate in the political process. And that has produced a very different level of awareness. Uh, and it is that knowledge that constructs publics too. I mean, that does primarily, right? I mean, I think that, and so that's what comes to mind. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to see if we have time. Do we have time for, I'm just. Okay, so two more questions. Yeah, okay, thank you. I can't see, sir. Hi, Teddy, Aaron oh Betsky. Oh my God, hi, Aaron, how are you? <laughs> nice to see you, nice surprise. Um, the question is this, you, I've been following and admiring, obviously, what you've been doing um, <clears throat> in <clears throat> the uh, inner city neighborhoods. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, my question is, the, the issue seems to be becoming again, now that the recession <clears throat> is clearing up in America, the um, other side of the socioeconomic spectrum. I noticed that uh, house prices and house sizes have risen again to over 3,000 square feet, over 300 square meters in America. What is it that we can do to attack the both socially and environmentally wasteful aspects of those kind of suburbs. I know that you've made proposals for how those kinds of large homes could be used and subdivided, which is great mm. in a, for economic crisis, but for the increasing part of the population that demands and has come to expect these kind of oversized homes mm. and after the crisis is going right back to buying them way out there, out in the exurbs. What can be done? What could we be done? This is what's the question that yes, I've been asking yes. myself for 10 years. What can be done with yeah. those situations? No, you know, and, and, and there is a huge part of the presentation that, I, of course, I, I did not include because uh, it addresses these issues, and I just touched it for a moment. You know, I recently was part of a conversation with the Museum of Modern Art about the current show, Foreclosed, Rehousing the American Dream, and as usual, it was calling on architects to solve the problem through design in this case. But I, I, I was convinced that we could not enter into that uh, conversation of thinking of how to solve the problem without entering into the discussion itself of the mythology of the American dream, which of course is, is speaks of this need to produce different types of interfaces with the public itself once more uh, in, in reimagining this. So on one hand is this very embedded kind of paradigm, right, of the American dream, as, as, as I was mentioning earlier, as this sort of right, right, to, to be left alone and so on. It has perpetuated this urbanization in steroids. The other thing is that while we have, of course, now finally witnessed the kind of, uh, the, the, how sustainable this growth has been. I mean, the problem is the way in which we, we have been growing. But, uh, and that's a slide that I usually show, because when I show, you know, coming from California, the epicenter of oil-hungry urbanization, and that produces its own icons. I show the Homer, right, that now has been sold to China, obviously. Uh, but uh, I show the Homer as this emblem of this sort of uh, urbanization and steroids. But then I say the problem is not only in the way we've been growing, but in the way we think we are solving the problem. And the next slide is the Homer full of photovoltaic panels. You know what I mean? And, and so, in essence, uh, obviously, without challenging, again, once more, at the core of the, what I was trying to say today, without challenging, the very politics and economics that have produced that kind of growth. It's very difficult to advance the conversation in this, in this context. I've been, and the, the image of the pixelation of this uh, confetti into the largeness is suggesting, of course, that the future of these environments depend on the alteration of the large with the small. And not only I, per, I, I refer to the, the contingency of these econo uh, informal economies and social densities, but primarily it's about rethinking the, the, the property models. Because the first thing that would have to be altered in Southern California is the size of those humongous parcels. 
And that already has been happening with these Mac mansions in many places in California being retrofitted by two or three families living together and so on. But the point uh, probably is returning to a history, and this is maybe a, a relevant in terms of a, a awareness in the public. At some point in the United States, at some point the uh, financial and political institutions collaborated seemingly to support the small guy in many of these neighborhoods. In other words, many of the older neighborhoods in Los Angeles, whether flanking Wilshire Boulevard or many of those older uh, sort of fabrics, uh, what made them very interesting uh, was that they were made of duplexes, fourplexes, and, 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 and six packs, as they are called in, in California, right? So in other words, models that enabled one property owner to build a unit in the back, to rent it, and produce a condition of, of susten sustainability. In other words, it was an, a, a, an urbanization based on a small scale development. And at some point, the, the kind of small scale of that development really uh, grew, obviously, with the type of financial and political logics that uh, excluded communities from building their own housing stock. And those small parcels began to consolidate in larger territories only accessible by huge finances uh, in the developer's uh, power. You see what I'm trying to say? So I think that while well, might be anathema or to, 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 to talk about the small scale development in many metropolitan contexts, I'm convinced that at least in the territory I work, it is in fact returning to a small scale where experimentation can thrive. Mainly at a moment when l large, you know, the large scale developments really have come to, to a stop. So that, that's, that would be in reference to what you were, you know. Oh. So in, in this context, the, the, also the small scale does not pertain to the scale of houses, no. but also the, the, the activation of that space, that, that empty space. In other words, the differentiation of that in between. Uh, so in many of the models that we're trying to advance in these neighborhoods are not just about houses on their own, which is a suburban paradigm, whether of the Netherlands of California or California, but it's about the kind of socioeconomic programming that needs to be injected in a variety of pieces mm. that, you know what I'm saying, that can, and, and back again to the notion, so in case it escaped, because I was maybe talking too fast maybe, is that somebody has to curate those relationships. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that, and they can, you know, in architecture school, they teach us how to design buildings, but yeah. they never teach us how those buildings will be maintained, you know, mm -hmm. in the long term. I, I recently yeah. saw the images of this uh, symphony hall somewhere in England that the day it opened, it closed because there was no more money yeah. to, we, to, to, to... We have a history of know. new build public infrastructure without, without program money. Yeah. Actually, in the book, we also examine precisely this question using the case study of Almira as well. You know, so this is very interesting. The relate, and, and, and we juxtapose this with the, with the, the new anti-squatting <coughs> legislation. So there are these two kind of oppositional. One, based on the premise of the development of individualization and ownership and creative freedom within a new build territory, and the other to do with a very different form of kind of space sharing. But we have one final question here, Tati. Yes, final question on behalf of SCORE, Foundation for Art and Public Domain. But basically, um, maybe a closing remark, because of yes. you've answered already a lot. So from the university laboratory to your practice as an architect and to artist practice, I was wondering how much of you allow artists to influence your practice. One of the examples from the symposium, Actors, Agents and Attendance on Social Housing, was from Jeanne van Heeswijk. And one of the things that struck me was that um, architects tend to be involved much earlier in the process of thinking spatial design. And I think it credits you from your practice that you try to enlarge on that mandate and not only solve a spatial issue, but bring out these sort of underlying social structures, which is exactly what defines, I guess, good artist practice. So is there maybe a blueprint possible where architects meet artists and bring forward the discussion and, and uh, collaborate or join forces into uh, really mm -hmm. touching upon these underlying social practices in public domain? Yes, that's no, it. that's... Yeah. 
No, it's a, uh, you know, I teach in a visual arts department, so I'm in constant collaboration with, with artists. I decided to kind of leave the School of Architecture to participate of a more complex, more um, interesting conversation in, in, in terms of inter interdisciplinarity, even though interdisciplinarity has been reduced to just meeting at a round table where everybody just offers points of view, you know, uh, from their own disciplines. But uh, truly what has been essential to me has been how do we exchange the procedures of the other, right? So for me it has been essential to not only to be inspired by artists in certain artistic practices, I never forget when Thomas Hirschhorn did that project, you know, with the Pompidou, the Precarious Museum, where the artist becomes a kind of interlocutor and facilitator of these new institutional relations. Uh, or of course, Jane Van Haswick uh, herself in, in the kinds of projects that really look at the informal economy as devices to rethink uh, social organization and so on. So what I'm interested is in not only the collaboration that is symbolic uh, in many ways, but in the, in, in by, in the, um, the possibility that can be opened up by e exchanging our own procedures, right, of ways of working. And, and in that sense, it's not only artists, but I've been more influential by developers. I, I, the point is, you know, for me has been how to almost uh, steal the procedures of the developer, the kind of knowledge embedded in the organization and distribution of resources and so on. So uh, that has been essential. And of course, theoretically as well, uh, I've been very influential in, um, I've, I've been very influenced by uh, the reference to some process-based uh, work. I mean, I never forget uh, Stan Allen's uh, uh, essay on field conditions where he looks at post-minimalism as a very interested, interesting period in, in, in art where the artists are not only interested in the material conditions, uh, but uh, primarily in the conditions by which materials are distributed. And so it's a kind of reversal of, of you know, a kind of more uh, operational dimension of uh, process. Uh, in that sense, that has been the, the most uh, emancipatory kind of possibility is that we as artists or architects could in fact be the designers of conditions within which you know, these institu institutional protocols are uh, reorganized. Finally, I could just mention very quickly that just to, to you know, because I know that I showed images of the Tijuana slums and the kind of creativity embedded in them and the immigrants you know, retrofitting the American city. I don't want to leave you with the impression that, how should I say that, because that creativity is so, uh, dramatic and so fundamental that it is about uh, those environments existing on their own. This is a critique that Mike Davis makes, in fact, in Planet of Slums. He says, well, we must acknowledge that creativity, that, that, that should not suggest that those people should be left alone, that there is the need, of course, for uh, support systems that are injected into those environments, whether socially, economically. What I'm trying to say is that I believe in government, and in a sense is the possibility of a very different interface between institutions and those environments. So the injecting of support systems, infrastructural and economic, but that finally really also uh, uh, enable the, the co-production of those spaces by those local economies. I think it's that interface or that mediation between the top down and the bottom up, what really is at stake. You know what I mean? I mean, I'm saying this because a lot of people think that my work is only about the bottom up. I'm interested, I think, in that a very critical interface that needs to occur uh, uh, between those scales, sorry. Uh, no, no, uh, actually it's very exciting. We want to continue uh, more and more and more because uh, it opens up new uh, uh, avenues. Uh, I'm director of SCORE, but at the same time I had two hats. I'm from Istanbul, so while I'm listening uh, uh, Teddy's wonderful lecture and while I was uh, listening uh, all the comments, I was thinking um, all, uh, all the developments, at least uh, since 90s, uh, happening in Istanbul, and now it becomes uh, like the peak point, the climax, uh, 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 because in Istanbul the urban transformation is going on unleashed, and uh, fashion after neoliberalism, and uh, uh, fashion after also uh, attracting the global uh, uh, capital, especially from our east, from the Arab world. And uh, what Teddy is mentioning, lastly, about the uh, small scale illegal uh, uh, settlements, growing them, 
And uh, uh, maybe 10 years ago, we all a little romanticized about the, uh, uh, the allowance uh, in Turkey of uh, developing uh, uh, illegal settlements. Uh, and uh, we were thinking that, oh, this is great. Okay, we don't have real structure, but at least uh, this gives an opportunity to the so-called commons immigrants from Anatolia to live in Istanbul illegally in the best places. But now we understand that it was a very important state stage to for the land transfer because now all these areas are subjected heavily to uh, 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 the urban transformation and uh, a, a government first uh, privatized them through the uh, uh, illegal uh, immigrants from Anatolia, and now they become uh, major sites for the very, very big developers again. So it was, uh, we understood that it was a stage uh, in the uh, uh, development, urban transformation. But at the same time, I totally agree, totally agree with Teddy that we really look uh, microscopically the details and specificities of each uh, case. And for Istanbul, uh, maybe some of you know, maybe don't, uh, I am the next curator, and we will continue all these uh, discussions, uh, hopefully uh, together. Uh, I just wanted to uh, uh, continue with you, with our Prosecco's uh, <laughs> at the side, and um, uh, hopefully uh, in small groups, and then hopefully in Istanbul together. Thank you. Um, I'd like, to, I'd like to thank Teddy Cruz very much for a fantastic introduction to these ideas today. So, Teddy, thank you very much. <laughs>